We are on a mission. A mission to save and revitalize independent pharmacy. On the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast, you'll get actionable business advice. Hear stories from industry leaders. And share a laugh or two with us. Fuel your passion for pharmacy. One conversation at a time. Welcome to the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Key, president of Pioneer X. And today I'm with my co host, Marsha. Hi, I'm Marsha Bivens, director of marketing for Pioneer X. Today we are here with Tim Ulbrich, CEO and co founder of Your Financial Pharmacist. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Tim. I love your setup. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're That's we're kind of awesome. we're kind of fond of it. Yeah. It's uh it's kind of uh, evolved over time. I can see you True. kind of evolved to the individual, not the big bulky headphones. Um, yes, yes, yes. I think I, some uh, of the podcasts that they've gone to video, they just think that the big bulky headphones make them look like it, official. It looks like the initial Real. start thing, but then it's like between. It just gets uncomfortable. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna get to the nitty gritty of it, but it's just it just gets uncomfortable, and then. It's just kind of funny when you see like the guys, sometimes me walk out and you have like the, the, uh, the hair stuck from the head. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah we've we, been tempted to send the other, I think sometimes we have guests on the show and we've sent them the big headphones. They have headphone envy. They're like, why do you get the little headphones? And we right? don't because, have the big headphones. Well, I mean, like I had to do my hair. We, we have today. the ones that go in our ears, very nice and quaint and that kind of thing. Um, but like we, there's a pink wrap around my set, so that way when Mark or Josh sit in here, they're not putting in my headphones, and I'm not going, ooh, whose ear goop is this? Right. So, right. I mean, that's why we do the headphones, because that's very easy. It's a lot easier to clean and not worry about where it's less been. intimate. Y- yes. Yeah, right. There's a lot less be- intimate. That's the kind of deal. So let's just start off with you telling some of us about you. You're a very interesting guy, so tell us um, how, did, how, did, how did baby Tim start out and get, get to where he is today? <laughs> Baby Tim grew up in a business uh, family, which I think has had a lot of influence on the work that I'm I'm doing now. Although I had a very uh, swervy pathway, I guess you could say, into entrepreneurship. So I went to pharmacy school right out of high school, direct, direct entry program. I wish I had a great story of why pharmacy. You know, I, I living in the academic world, working in admissions. I was always compelled by those very elaborate essays that talked about the passion of pharmacy or a family member that inspired their journey. And to be honest, I, I don't have that. I mean, I, I, I was really interested in science and math. I, like many 18 year olds were like, yeah, I probably should go to college, but you know, what, what should I do looking for a good job? Mm-hmm. And I had guidance counselors said, Hey, you should go to pharmacy school. Uh, and I said, all right, so- Why sounds not? good. My, What's my the parents worst thing thought that was a, yeah, my parents thought that was impressive. Hey, you're going to get a doctor degree. You're going to make good money. Little did I know about kind of all that pharmacy uh, could be. And also little did I know that the financial journey uh, that that would take me on for both good and some of the challenges as well. So mm-hmm. I graduated from Ohio Northern University, go polar bears uh, in 2008 at the ripe age of 24 and did a year of residency at Ohio State, really fell in love with more of the academic side of pharmacy. Interesting. And went right from residency into an academic role where I spent a little over a decade in in a few different uh, academic roles, some full-time on campus, some administration, some that was a little bit in the practice side of things as well. And as I now reflect back on it, I would really describe my academic time really as academic entrepreneurship. Now, those two words don't go together. Don't go together. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that's why I constantly felt this sort of na- nagging feeling of like, ah, am I in the right place? And what can we do? And what can we grow? And I eventually left uh, academia in 2021 to work full time on the business that I'm working on now, although that had been a journey really dating back to 2015. And that really started from the financial wellness side of, of things. When I graduated again at, at, at the ripe age of 24, I looked up and I said, hey, I'm finally making a great income. I, I knew that was going to happen. That's good news. Bad news is I didn't really understand what it was going to mean to try to pay off a couple hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. And you and I both know that that's all, all too normal uh, in our profession. Yep. And when I yep. get the opportunity to speak with 
you know, pharmacists all across the country and I throw out those big numbers, you know, I, I never get an emotional reaction, right? Because <laughs> everyone's like, yeah, that's me. That's me. And, you know, I think for, for my wife and I, in our journey, we've now got four, four boys, uh, that wow. we're doing our, our, our best to raise as well. We said, Hey, this income is, is really good, but it really only goes so far when, you know, you're, you're raising a family, you're trying to pass student loans, we're trying to invest and save for the mm -hmm. future, do all, all the things we know we're supposed to do. And long story short, we, we got to this very critical point in 2012. Uh, I had caught fire with learning about personal finance, reading a lot of books, listening to podcasts, and one book in particular, The Millionaire Next Door by Dr. Tom Stanley. He talks a lot about the research of those that, that are successful with their finances and b building you know, wealth over time. And he talks about the importance of net worth, not income, but net worth really being the indicator, the true indicator of your financial health. Interesting. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, I, I've earned almost a half a million dollars of income, you know, through the first four-ish years of my career. And I've got a net worth of negative $225,000. This is yep. not going in the direction right. that it and, is. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a four-year degree and 10 years of debt. And exactly. every year you look at that that four, your, um, your W-2, you're like, oh, but you know, this is what I made this year and, but this is what my net worth is and it's negative triple that. Yeah. So, yep. And, there, there's the, probably the visceral response that you're looking for in any type of, when you announce that. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone, you know, now we're obviously in a very high inflationary period. Everyone knows the, the limitations of how far your income can go. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that a lot of pharmacy graduates feel this. There's you know, may, maybe unintentional, you know, maybe so, somewhat there, you know, w was used as the, the growth in pharmacy graduates and, and uh, the growth of pharmacy schools happened. But there's definitely this feeling of like, hey, I'm going to make a great income. And then there's, you know, the reality of, you know, what does that mean long term and how do I right. stretch that income as far as it could go? And so, you know, we we weren't crazy spenders. You know, we, we live in uh, Ohio, not a crazy high cost of living area. And we didn't really make any, I would say, extravagant financial purchases or decisions, but we just felt like we were spinning our wheels financially. And that's something I hear every day from pharmacists across the country now in the work that I'm doing. And so we said, hey, we, we've got to get more intentional, you know, getting back to the basics. We've got to get on the same page with the goals and the vision and, and the budget and the strategy. And ultimately, we were able to pay off that couple hundred thousand dollars of debt in fall of 2015. And that really started the the journey of talking nice. and working with pharmacists all across the country on this topic. Nice. So four boys, that's expensive. Four, yes. As compared uh, to four, what? Four girls? Yes. <laughs> girls want pretty, pretty princess dresses and four pretty, girls pretty would be expensive. Yes. Four boys are just invasive. Um, they break loud. Bones. Yeah, they, they are, break they things. Are, and what are they, they into? They loud. And... They break things. They um. Yeah. I remember we had so, our we had our daughter first, and then a son. And the son told us things we needed to to childproof that we never even thought about with the daughter. Right. He just That's was real. What can I get into? So, mm -hmm. all right. So back. So to, what are the ages? Yeah. So my oldest, I have 11, nine, seven, and three. And you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. The, 11. The, All right. So I see a, so he's smart and a planner. I see 11, nine, seven. I see a pattern, right? Three. Then I see an aberration, <laughs> right? So <laughs> boom, Usually boom, that, that big of an age gap. It's yeah, a, oops, honey, we plan, forgot something. Plan, plan, plan. Either not so planned or mind changed. So which one was it? Was it it was a little bit of, you know, we, we moved uh, in between our third and our fourth. We had kind of talked about, you know, is it is it four? Are we a family of five? And it was planned. Th thankfully, I'm, I'm glad to say that. But, you know, it's been a, a challenge kind of re-entering, re right? Yeah. You know, the, it wasn't the part of the original two. plan. So it was, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> it was yep. a replan. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Because the original plan was on twos. <laughs> 11, 9, 7, see, 5. We'd had a pattern here, but we... Well, uh, Cohen hit five and... and and uh, our son, my son hit when he hit kindergarten. That's when Mark started talking about another baby. And I literally laughed in his face and told him to get a puppy. <laughs> and he showed up with a puppy four hours later. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So, it's real. The, so you the, are cold. That's cold. Yeah. I, 
I was just ready. I was done with diapers, and I was just got kindergarten, and I was I I wasn't and ready you were career for career oriented, and, and I was yeah, I was very yeah. career oriented at the time. Still yeah. am. Yep, and did a great job at that. So built a decent company. But um, so soccer, karate. What are the boys into? Well, you know, at, at home karate is just an everyday thing, right? It's yep. like the WWE at our house, you know, I think. But uh, yeah, so- soccer, basketball, um, you know, flag football. We, we play, I've had, mul- I've had multiple injuries keeping up with them. You know, we play rollerblade hockey in the driveway. Oh, nice. Wow. You, you, you name it, they're in lacrosse. My oldest is getting into now. They're really in the music now, which is a ton of fun. My, my what? wife. That wasn't the that uh, wasn't the next one. That's kind of like eleven nine seven three. You were like yes. all these others, and then music. It kind of you broke your pattern again. So tell us about the music. So the mu- music comes from um, I-, I think a little bit of exposure. They're they're all very creative. I can't take credit for that. My wife homeschools the four of them. Wow. Uh, Sh- Sean Mendez of all people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean Mendez, Canadian artist, pop artist. Uh, they has caught their attention from there. They caught fire with guitar and piano and you name it and they have an incredible music teacher that unlike when we were growing up you know i remember the music teachers of like this is the book and you will play the book and you know until your fingers get tired which is why people end up hating piano and instrument right she does such a cool job of like yeah we got to learn the basics but you want to play sean mendez let's figure it out we'll play sean mendez so So are are we looking at probably the next uh jonas brothers or no i was just saying with with him with tim they have a boy band that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I was referencing the boy bands that are brothers. And no, you know, Jonas Brothers is interesting because you remember the fourth Jonas Brother is yep. kind of non existent, right? He's non existent. Right. Yep. And we've got the fourth who's a little bit younger. So I can already see that playing out. You know, he's trying to keep up the best he <laughs> yeah. can. But. Yeah. A wooden spoon on a pot in the kitchen floor it just doesn't, doesn't go with it. <laughs> It does not. He tries, but it does not. It keeps yeah. him preoccupied so mom can do dinner, but it does not go in with, with the rest that's of right. the big brothers. Yeah, so. that's right. So what kind of services um, does your company provide? So you say yeah, financial we, planning. What does, that, what does that mean? Yeah, we have uh, probably our bread and butter is we have a fee-only financial planning service uh, that we – primarily work with pharmacists all across the country. We're not exclusive to pharmacists, but it's about 90% of all of our clients based on kind of the niche and and the marketing and the content that we do. Uh, I've got a planning team that works for me. I'm not a licensed uh, financial planner. We've got uh, clients in 44 or 45 states, I think right now across the country. So we do everything virtual. And fee, fee only is really important. It's an emerging part of the industry, which really got me excited getting into this because, you know, when I, I think like many people, you hear financial planning, you think like, Ugh, like, what am I being sold? Is, are, are my best mm-hmm. interests in mind? You know, is this person taking care of me? And there's a real shift towards uh, a fiduciary fee only mo- model, which means that the client is paying the planner for the advice that they're giving. They're not getting compensated for recommending you know, insurance or investment products that may or may not be in their best interest. So I love that model because, you know, it really re- resonates with me from a transparency standpoint of, hey, you're, 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 playing, you're paying for the advising, but whether we're talking student loans, home purchase, investments, you know, planning for social security, it doesn't matter what topic, we mm-hmm. don't have a bias to spend, in, you know, one time in, in one area over another. So, so at, is that a percentage or is it a, a dollar value when you say fixed fee? It's a, it's a flat fee model up to a certain asset threshold, and then it goes to a percentage. So we really try to build the model that we can serve someone from 25 when they first graduate all the way up to, you know, more of a traditional pre-retiree retiree, um, because the industry, frankly, does not serve younger pharmacists, practitioners well. You know, often when when industry is is marketing towards a young pharmacist or physician or anyone for that matter, you know, especially if they don't have a lot of assets, which let's be honest, most new graduates don't, right? They have a negative net worth, typically student loans. So if they don't have assets to manage, often a firm is like, eh, we're not really interested now, maybe in the future. And usually what that leads to is, hey, let's, you know, sell this insurance product or this other thing, which you may or may not need. Mm -hmm. We'll kind of get you in the door and then we'll, we'll build that relationship long-term. So that group, and, and one of the exciting things we focused on is you know that group that's that first five to ten years out 
there's a lot of things coming at you. You've got student loan debt, you're transitioning either to your first or, or second job. Often you're buying a home, you're starting a family, you're trying to get investments started, get the insurance base covered. And arguably, outside of maybe that withdrawal strategy in retirement, arguably that that's where so much of the ROI can come from really good comprehensive holistic planning. So that's been something I've been really proud of that we've been able to build a model that is number one, transparent, uh, number two, really, really serves and understands pharmacists well. And number three is able to serve them all throughout the span, right. you know, of their career. And then, you know, much of what we do that, that that's a big piece. Much of what we also do is, is a lot of personal finance, education, financial literacy. You know, we've got a uh, few podcast episodes we publish weekly, lots of speaking events. We work with a lot of organizations, associations, uh, employer, you know, benefit types of things, uh, college programs, and so forth. Um, got a lot of free content on our on our website, all around financial literacy and education. Yeah, it's interesting and that, um, you know, Erin Dalton, I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with her. Yeah, love yeah. her. She's one of my favorite people. Um, yep. She works on the education side. And she moved from being a pharmacist to educate the education side because there was a lot of things that she felt students were coming out with that, yeah, the school's equipping you to fill bottles, follow the guidelines, yep. do, you know, for your profession, but nothing that prov that is providing the proper education for the, basically the, that puts you in the hard knock life skills that, That's you know, right. would be great if you already knew it and the information's out there, but it's just like, what information do you trust? Like you said, you get some that are like, am I just trying, I'm just trying to sell you this, but I'm, there's not much value versus yeah. I've got the value and I really want to help you. Yeah. And so it's interesting, like, do you get asked to speak at university programs about, you know, like, hey, this is the great. Now you've done the pharmacy stuff. Now let's talk about life skills that you're going to need. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've worked with um, probably north of 150, 200 organizations at this point. I, I think in this past year, we probably touched 20 or 30 colleges, state associations, national. We're seeing some momentum with employers and fellowship programs. And there, there, there's definitely this evolving understanding and respect more broadly around wellness, but within that financial is an important part of the wellness pie. Mm -hmm. And I think in our profession, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago when I was in school, I know that th this topic would be what the soft skills, you know, it's not the hard clinical stuff that is changing. I think in part, you know, we've seen the evolution of our accreditation standards where there's a more focus on professional development. I think mm -hmm. this topic is being accepted as a really important one. And the case I'm trying to really make is that if we have a financially well pharmacist workforce, they're a better workforce. Yep. They're more mm -hmm. engaged uh, with their employer and we need innovation and disruption in our profession. And we're not going to see innovation and disruption from people that are not financially well because you're not going to take those risks, whether you work with someone or you start your own business. And so that's one of my, my big things that I'm passionate about personally, and also just working with thousands of folks is that if you feel financially well, you're bringing a better version of yourself to work, a better version of yourself to home. And you're probably more open to thinking about the what if types of questions mm -hmm. and how can I you know, take some risk with my employer? How can I potentially start a business, do these other things? Yeah, that are you're really not thinking move. about that. Two hundred thousand dollars debt and going, hmm. This bonus I'm getting in March, I can throw this much towards that bonus and then this much in this savings. Yeah. So exactly. what's the what's the threshold in assets that moves from a fixed price to a percentage? Yeah. Uh, I, in our model, it's a million dollars is is the threshold that we have. Um, in in other models, there there is no standard. Um, so some models exist where, you know, they won't maybe don't take clients until they have 200 or 300,000 in assets. And then at that point, there'll be a scaling, uh, fee model. And then usually as the asset base grows from one to two to 3 million, it kind of tears down in the fee. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we looked at a million dollars, uh, is our point. We started with a flat fee model only. Um, and we've kind of transitioned over time. I, I think there's a false belief in the industry that, you know, the, the work as a client grows in terms of their asset base doesn't grow proportionally with the fee. And I would say I used to agree with that model, but when you really get into like things like withdrawal strategies, tax planning, optimization, social security, like if done well, 
the ROI on that is just massive. You know, we talk so much about the accumulation phase of, hey, you need two, three, four, five, six million, whatever the number is. What we don't talk a lot about is like, well, what are we going to do when we actually decide we need to replace our income? We need to build a retirement paycheck. And how do we do that in a tax efficient way? And th this is one of the reasons we actually started building a tax firm in house is that, in my opinion, tax planning and financial planning those have to be in the same boat rowing in the same direction. And that's where you see a compound ROI on the service. If there's a disconnect between the tax plan and the financial plan, whether we like it or not, there's a lot of tax strategy to be, to be employed. Uh, and as especially as you start building wealth and or you have diversified income, real estate, business, whatever it might be, at that point, you really see the ROI of tax strategy with the financial planning. So is, so, that, is that trust and, and doing things like that or... Yeah, yeah. There's certainly a, a, an estate planning side of it as well. We don't have an in-house le legal team, so that's a piece we would work with externally. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of nuances in small businesses and tax planning and strategy, even tax planning strategy on the front end. You know, there's there's some nuances with student loan repayment strategy, specifically around loan forgiveness, where sometimes you might be beneficial to file separately versus you know file jointly is kind of the the normal standard advice. And if you work with an accountant or a planner that doesn't know student loans inside and out, and there's unfortunately way, way too many details to know in student loans, it shouldn't be that complicated, but it is, you know, that's where you really start to see the, the strategy employed. So it really depends on where they're at in their career. But yeah, I mean, it could, could be a, a trust side of things and, and others on the back end of also just most people when, when they get to that retirement point you know, whatever the number is, three, four, five, six, $10 million. Usually that's coming from multiple buckets, right? There's 401k or multiple 401ks, there's IRAs, there's brokerage accounts, there might be, you know, digital asset accounts, real estate, depending on how they've invested business and how you start to draw those down. And when you draw those down is, is really important. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, <clears throat> you know, it's something you think about as you get older. And, and a lot of times I, I was turned off by, you know, I, I talked to one financial planner and, and, and their percentage and, and, and their advice was, hey, put all of it in this fund, which also charges you a percentage. A percentage. And, that's right. Yeah. And yep. you're like, OK, that what you just told me didn't vary based on how much money I have to invest or how much assets I have. But, yeah. but when you talk about tax planning and some of the other stuff, you know, probably just was talking to the wrong people. These are people at my bank. Um, you just talking to the wrong people. Yeah, the fees are so, I'm so glad you brought that up because a lot of people think, oh, I'm paying an advisor for the fee. That's the end of it. Really the hidden fees mm -hmm. and li listeners can pull up, pull up your 401k statement, pull up your IRA statement. There's expense ratios for every investment you're in, whether that's a mutual fund, an ETF, an index fund. Uh, and some of those are transparent. Some of those are not transparent. Yep. And those might not seem big. You know, people look at it and they're like, ah, oh, 0.34, what does that matter? Well, when you run 0.34%, you know, per year over 30 years, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees. And so we really adhere to more of a passive investing type of approach, specifically on the traditional investments where, you know, you know, we're often getting fund fees down to 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.06. So cl as close to zero as possible. So we can maintain the integrity of the investment pie. But another reason why the fee only fiduciary piece matters is in a traditional investing model, if someone is only getting paid off of recommending a product or a percentage of assets, guess where the incentive is? You give as much money to me so I can increase my fee. Whereas like we're often talking to clients about, hey, might you diversify and buy real estate? Well, guess what? If we advise a client to move money from a brokerage account that we're managing to real estate, that's the right move potentially for some people, but that might mean actually a reduction in our fee. And, and that's why the fiduciary model matters because they are legally obligated to act in your best interest. And if that's the move, they need to make that recommendation whether or not that's going to impact their fee. Mm -hmm. hmm. So how many employees do you have today? We have a team of uh, 13. Actually, our newest uh, team member joined today, a uh, lead planner out of El Paso, uh, Texas. So I've got um, our largest part of our team is on the uh, financial planning. We've got five uh, CFPs on our team. Um, and then we've got, uh, three folks that are on the tax side of the business. So CPA, uh, enrolled agents, uh, there as we're growing that practice. And then I've got a couple, a uh, few people on the me media side that really helped me with like the podcast, the blog, the social media, 
uh, the website and just kind of keeping it all all re- moving forward. So is that your major, um, you think the podcast is your major advertising method? Is that? It, it, it is, you know, it, it, it's a hard one to track, but when we are, our, our main call to action for financial planning is uh, we do a one hour discovery call, get to know us, get to know you. Is it a good fit for us? Is it a good fit for you? And in that booking, we ask people, Hey, wh- where did you kind of hear about us? And podcast is number one on that list. Nice. Uh, number two is speaking events, you know, webinars. What's really interesting about this, this is a cool lesson in like patiently building a business is that more often than not, it's a, Hey, I heard you heard about you a couple of years ago. I started listening to the podcast. I attended a speaking event and then I've been kind of following the journey, listening to content, you know, working on this on my own, getting some really good educational information. And then something happened. You know, I got married. I started a family, um, you know, got an inheritance, taking care of an elderly parent, whatever it might be. And they get to the point of, Hey, I'm really interested in working one-on-one. And I've already felt like, because of the podcast, because of these other resources, I already felt like we're kind of on this journey together, which gives me so much joy because I've always built a business from first and foremost, we're going to provide value with free content. Yep. And then if you feel like that content is valuable, such that you're looking for one-on-one help, we're here if and when you're ready. And for the vast majority of folks, they, they may determine, hey, that's not now, it's in the future. Uh, and sometimes they engage with us for free stuff and they might hire someone else that they deem is a better fit. That That's okay. But I think if we focus on and don't lose sight of that, let's provide really good financial education, literacy value. Mm-hmm. And then we're also here to, to grow the business on that as well. Yeah, kind of value first. Mm-hmm. I, I, one value of the things first that, and you're creating a trust. Yeah. And, and I've yeah. seen where some organizations have gone bad, you know, where that goes poorly is they start off with that model. And then they start to decide, oh, we're giving away too much stuff for free. You know, we need Mm -hmm. to crank down the free stuff, right? And you need to be paying for this. You know, why are they not paying for this? Mm -hmm. And then gradually the business kind of, and that's, and that, I think that's, you know, figuring out that balance of what's for free. But I I think your business is a good model for that Mm -hmm. Um, because there's only so much you can do. Um, with free content, you know, there's a lot of books and free content, but there's, you know, at some point you've got to take it to the next level. And I like that, that you're kind of there on their journey until it gets complicated enough. And, and normally complicated enough means more assets, which is where you guys would want to really get involved in the first place. So, yep. Yep. More, more assets, or we often hear from folks. I mean, the number of calls we have with individuals that, you know, the emotion is palpable, Some sometimes in tears that, you know, I've got all these things going on. And what I often tell folks is that so much value, the financial plan, yeah, it's the numbers, it's the goals. We got to move all that forward, but never to underestimate the peace of mind and clarity that comes from when you have all of these competing priorities that are swirling in your head Mm -hmm. and you have that constant stress and internal dialogue about what about this, what about that? And when you get them on paper, and we have a plan, especially if you have two individuals in the household working on this together, even if the numbers don't move in the next month, you know, it's going to take time. That clarity of the plan and feeling of momentum and we're moving forward is incredible. And we, we see this emotion every day of, you know, I, I feel like I'm overwhelmed. I'm frustrated, I'm confused. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily love what I do, but I feel like mm-hmm. I'm handcuffed because of my financial plan. Th- those are big emotions and yeah we've got to build investment assets for the future that's that's a must we just have to do it but a lot of the financial planning is really addressing some of those those stresses and some of the emotional side as well what are you thinking about the uh, dir apocalypse Ooh, yeah in uh first quarter 2024 are you advising a lot of customers on that a lot of have a lot of clients thinking about so you're talking about DIR on the, like the independent farm on the pharmacy side? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talking about the fact that I'm going to have to come up with an extra DI, you know, that in January 1 of 2024, the DIR fees are getting removed in real time. Plus I still have to pay for the last quarter's DIR fees. Yeah. It, admittedly, I, I know surface level on this, but I don't, I don't know the details or advise people on the DIR stuff. So we don't, we don't have a lot of, we have a handful of independent clients, but not, not many that not I many. can speak to that. <clears throat> yeah. Really, uh, you know, so fundamentally what it is, is the way DIR fees got, set up they were retroactive retroactive i guess that means yes i i was i had to pay them later mm-hmm. so yep. you know three months of of claims and stuff like that and then i get a bill right three months of claims and i get a bill 
right, based on this, this back analysis. Well, the law has changed that, that had to come out at the point of sale. So I, I kind of been borrowing mm. money, even though we should say it's our money, so I shouldn't borrowing it, you're taking it later. So I've been putting off when the money gets taken yep, yep. based on the income I'm getting. So, you know, I do a claim and I get paid within 30 days, and then I owe a portion of that maybe a couple months later. Well, the law has changed where it's got to come out in real time. So what that means, there'll be a period where those move to coming oh, yeah. out in real time out of the money, plus I owe last quarters. Oh, so geez. the quarter worth of money that I've kind of been borrowing, I've got to come up with. So I, I need to I need to make a plan. So in 2023, yeah. I need to be saving up for that, right? So let me, let me and again, I'm sure we'll edit this out. Let me ask you a question just so I understand this going forward. Is that, for, when I hear that from a business owner, I think short-term pain Right, like cash that flow. I have to do, yep, but cash flow exactly. But long term, like to me, that seems like hallelujah. That long term, I mean, it's I, better. Yes, because okay. I don't have this mystery of I think right. it's going to be thirty thousand and it's fifty. But 000. the first the month, yeah. once everything goes into place, is going to be very expensive. Yeah, um, that first quarter. That first quarter is going sure. to yeah. be bad. So I'll have to roll out some money I've been kind of borrowing in a way or paying later. Mm -hmm. And how how many are planning that from a cash flow standpoint? Or no, that's what I hope. That, that, hope a, a lot. We need to get the word out. A lot of yeah. people need to be. Um, you know, uh, Marshall made a point the other day. Our our software estimates your DR fees. They ought to be putting that money in the bank okay. and, and saving it. They ought to not be spending it. They ought to be thinking about, hey, I'm going to roll that to But it now. does make for a good idea for a blog topic. So and and I will gradually add that to the list. putting that money in the bank. Yeah. And there are some, I think, and I don't. I, Almost I, like a sinking fund for, for the payment. Of yeah. It in the yeah. Future. I need a, yeah. uh, or like a, a <laughs> reverse vacation exactly. uh, savings plan. I need to be saving yeah. for it slowly. You know, don't be hit. Uh, with yeah. it big time uh, at that, you know, and, in, 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 and we worry because, not we worry, but, you know, we look at, hey, how's that going to affect pharmacy software sales and in, yeah. in, those, in right. those three months that people are strapped. Um, and it's, you know, you're, that problem seems trivial to their challenges. You know, you have some people with some very big DR fees, but just wondering. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to skip back to you, you speak to students um, in universities and you work. Do you have like any kind of program that you put out there for pharmacy students who are interested in great? I've graduated and I'm buying this pharmacy. I'm not going to work for a big box chain. I'm starting my own thing. Do you have like a, a program that helps them get started in, in their financial wellness? You know, it's interesting you, you mentioned that. I mean, we've got a lot of educational content that I think can piece that together. But one of the opportunities we have realized is missing is actually coalescing that into something that's more packaged and streamlined to address exactly that, or even potentially more, more broadly that, hey, I have some an interest in doing something more non-traditional. You know, could, could be I'm going to buy a pharmacy, could be, you know, I'm going to go start, start this business or, you know, do whatever. We're seeing a lot of that. Uh, kind of expansion into non-traditional pharmacy entrepreneurship side hustles, whatever you want to call them. Um, and often what I hear is I would love to do X, Y, or Z. And X might be buy a pharmacy mm -hmm. or, you know, could could be something uh, that's uh, unrelated to that, but it's something more non-traditional. And then right behind that is but dot, dot, dot. I've got $200,000 student loan debt, you know, <laughs> to buy a home. I need the health insurance, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. how I'm going to save for retirement and all these things. And so we have pieces that address all of that. But one of the gaps we've identified is we really need, need something more streamlined and perhaps even a, a partner to work with that could help package that, that has a vested interest in growing the pipeline, if you will, of people that are interested in independent pharmacy, interested in entrepreneurship. And so we've dabbled in this. We, we've done a series on called employee to entrepreneurship which is more focused on people that are wanting to make that transition or figure out what that transition looks like. A lot of the same issues. Um, you know, we, we've highlighted a lot of different pharmacy entrepreneurs on our podcast with the hopes that not, not necessarily is that somebody will listen and say, hey, I'm going to go do exactly what that person is doing, but it gets them thinking more differently about, Oh, I know, I had no idea farm D could go do this or that. And then we really see an important role we can play in, how can we help people with the financial literacy and foundation so that they can go pursue whatever that area of interest is? So we've got the pieces, but we haven't yet packaged it together, I think, in the way that we could. So do you work with um, existing pharmacies in the way of like, um, hey, I'm working on succession planning. I, 
I want to have grow my pharmacy to this and then I want to sell it. Um, do you help or coordinate any type of succession planning like that and connecting a student who wants to buy a pharmacy with a pharmacist who's ready to retire and sell his business? We, we have not done that yet formally. We're actually growing right now our independent pharmacy base a little bit, specifically on, on some of the tax and uh, bookkeeping and accounting service side of things. And then we've got a handful that are a small handful that are planning clients as well. So a little bit of kind of coaching that may, may be happening, but nothing that is formalized. I have thought, and you, you guys can tell me wrong, I have kind of thought that through other associations and organizations that this is kind of lo locked down of like, you know, looking at junior partnership models and uh, almost like a um, mo model where, hey, I'm looking to buy, I'm looking to sell, and you can you can match people up and kind of help them through that succession. So I, I haven't necessarily thought of this as a huge area of opportunity. May maybe I'm wrong on that, but I I'm really specifically honed in on, we've got, you know, it's decreased from 15,000. We've got 10, 12,000 new pharmacy graduates coming out every year. What can we be doing for everyone that says, hey, maybe I want to do something different, what can we be doing to help support them personally with their finances so they can get a, go approach whatever that idea is with, with more confidence? Well, I think you see a, there's a change happening today. So if you went back over the last 10 years, Walgreens and CVS, the pharmacy that was retiring, would, was ready to pick it up. You know, they're, they're ready to pick up that pharmacy and they're paying good money for it. I think as, as you see those guys start thinking about healthcare more than just rooftops of pharmacies. They're not buying as many pharmacies. They're divesting some pharmacies in smaller towns. Right. You've got towns say, that there's, they've been, they sold got, a lot. This yeah. You got year. towns that they, they, um, you know, uh, one of the big three bought up several, uh, pharmacies, um, and had the only one close it. And now there's no pharmacy in town. that needs it. But, but as you see that you see pharmacies not selling for as much as they used to, bad or good, depending on whether you're retiring or, or buying. Um, but you see a lot of pharmacies now, those towns still need pharmacies. Those places still need pharmacy. You see them being bought by other independent pharmacists. And so yep. we see a big uptick, especially in our pharmacies, buying other pharmacies. Yes. So I think the opportunity to help that succession planning to help to realize, oh, hey, I can't just flip a switch and, and CVS is going to write me a check. I got to do something bigger. I probably, I, I'm, I need to either find another independent pharmacy who's willing to buy it, or I need a plan where I go find yep. a pharmacy student or a younger pharmacist that you, I'm going to do you, a, you build a your you know, a buyout pull an Obi -Wan over Kenobi. time. Um, yep. That's more, I think it, you're going to see more of that. I, I'm really bullish on independent pharmacy in, in the future. And maybe this is me being a naive business owner that has never owned a, a, an independent pharmacy. But if I put on my marketing hat and everything I've learned growing our business over the last seven years in all the hard work it is to develop leads and nurture those leads, if I own an independent pharmacy, and I remember talking with, with uh, another independent owner about this, you have people walking through your door every day to pick up a prescription that there's an opportunity to nurture that lead mm -hmm. and that relationship and to market other products Absolutely. and services that you're mm -hmm. And we don't, I'm generalizing here, but we don't often think of it that way, right? We think about it as people are walking through the door, we're a distribution channel, we fill the medication, they're out. I mean, that is a golden opportunity. If I, if I think about that as like, if I had a brick and mortar financial services business and every day I had three people that walked through the doors to pick up something, oh my gosh, that's 300 conversations I can have, mm -hmm. 300 leads I can nurture to really get to understand more about them, to segment those groups and audiences, and then to put them towards products and services that are gonna address their individual pain points that are unique to them. Wow, like what could we be doing and what other businesses you know, are afforded that type of an opportunity? So one of my favorite, so there is somebody who has, who has just honed in on this and like just, she owns it and, and she's made a company out of it. And she's not a pharmacist, she's a marketer. Um, she bought her dad's pharmacy, her and her husband, uh, Whaley's, ba Whaley's baby, Stacy Welling. And um, basically, she's targeting new mothers. So you come in, you get put on a, uh, you get put on your um, prenatal vitamin. And then it, she's got a trigger that starts that goes, oh, 
well, hey, do you know that we do a lot of other support programs for new mothers? So we have a, a breast a breastfeeding specialist to walk you through how breastfeeding, we have this baby section of other products and services that you're going to need. And like moms are the best because they are the ones that go to the pharmacy and pick up the prescriptions for not just themselves, their children, the husband, and maybe if they're taking care of, a, of an elderly parent or or a family member, then I'm going to go there. I'm going to get your cold and flu medication right. while I pick up, you know, some, my, my prescription. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, it, to me, it's, it's genius. It's just genius. Well, and the sign yeah, marketing well. and the fact of pharmacists providing some subset of primary care. So yep. you, you look at this big, um, you're having this, what, 50,000 reduction in, in general practitioners and things like that. And, all of a sudden, we see CVS and Walgreens and Walmart are going to tackle that by more general practice, practice, you know, practitioners. They're going to, we're going to open up clinics in our pharmacies. Um, I think Walmart was saying something like they're going to open up 2,700 clinics in their parking lot over the next year. Okay, guys, where are those coming from? Mm-hmm. Right? We're going to have this not enough general practitioners. Are you just going to fight for them? You know, mm-hmm. our answer is that pharmacy starts doing more of that flu, Absolutely. you know, can do flu a flu testing, test and yep. then prescribe Tamiflu or we can do a, 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 a UT test and then, you know, prescribe an antibiotic. And that's an answer. And, and some of the big guys were headed for that at first and they realized, hey, our model for doing pharmacy doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Because, you know, our, our deal is. Um, least pharmacist time possible where we have that capacity in independent pharmacy. So I, 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 right. I think it's being more differentiated how and that is. Also and, their and, focus and I don't think the way they're going is going to work. Your prescriptions and don't forget to check out cosmetics in the wine. Yeah. They're, they're I, not, they have, they're not, they have no interest. In I'm just the like, where, where are these people going to come? Care. Where are they going to get these? Are they going to get more get people them? to go to school? Yeah. You know, where and, are and they going to get them? I think if we zoom out, right. I think we zoom out and think about this from a, a uh, individual purchasing mindset behavior. I, I spent recently, I'm not going to name the name of one of the big box stores, but my son had to get a COVID shot, you know, back, back in the day and granted they were busy, but I, I had to wait an hour, which I totally understand there's a lot going on, but it gave me an hour to sit there and observe. Okay. And mm-hmm. every concern I have was validated in that hour. Of <laughs> oh yeah. That purely being a distribution channel that when you think about what's happening in terms of disruption in the industry, is not going, it, it's not outside of regulatory maintenance of that on a state level, it's not going to be sustainable from a business model as it currently is. I mean, me as a consumer, I'd be the first one with young kids. If I can log on and talk to, you know, a pediatrician, do a virtual visit, hit a couple of buttons and the med shows up at my door in two hours, sign me up. I'm, I'm there for sure. So I think that independent pharmacies are just so well positioned. And, and I think we as the consumer, we're tired of that. We're, we're tired of looking at this as a model. I have to go. It's, it's an inconvenience. You know, I have to wait. wait. It, it's a stressful environment to be in. I pick up my medication. There's no auxiliary ancillary services. But if we reimagine that whole experience of get out of the apples to apples conversation and not compare an independent pharmacy versus a box because they are doing all these other services. I think the prenatal services is just such a cool example. Well, now you're coming into a new experience and you're addressing a specific pain point and you're providing value in a way that is not provided when you walk into those other stores. Like, that's exciting. That's really exciting. And, and I think we have an awesome footprint of obviously brick, brick and mortar that's already there. But one of the things I'm really interested in is how do we foster the interest in entrepreneurship from the ground up? And, and I really believe, like from an academic standpoint, we should not be admitting people just on purely all of their you know, merit metrics around all the, how well they do in sciences and these things and hope we can sprinkle in a little bit of entrepreneurship that piques their interest. We mm. might need to be thinking about how do we recruit in people that have entrepreneurship characteristics and then add on to that the pharmacy education. Right. Well, in the, totally the bigger way. piece that, that also needs to be added to a far, to an education of a, of, of a pharmacist graduating and wanting to jump out and do their own thing is they, like you said, marketing, they need help with marketing, Sales, marketing because it's, it's like you said also with, you know, the frustration of when I tried to get my kid, their COVID, their COVID vaccines. And, um, the only one that had the vaccine that they were approved for 
Because the local independent pharmacy, they only had a mm-hmm. uh, Johnson and Johnson. They didn't have the one that was approved for his age group. And I had to schedule with Walgreens. And that was the biggest pain in the butt that I ever had and the most inconvenient. Whereas with my teenager, I walked in, I was like, hey, two COVID shots right here and there. And it's like, mm-hmm. sure, no problem. Fill this paper. Didn't have to make an appointment. Didn't have to go through some crappy website that was like, oh, jump through all these hoops. Tell us how you really feel. I think it's, I'm, I'm speaking for like how a bunch of people feel about these big, bo- yeah, don't, about don't hold back. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's, they need help with marketing and marketing. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. uh, building relationships, not just within the, with patients, but yeah. with doctor's offices that are going to help connect their patients with somebody That's that right. actually cares about their, um, I'm going to throw another name drop out at you. Uh, Nicolette Matthew does that. She works with pharmacies to help them with marketing. Um, and she's a pharmacist and she owns a pharmacy uh, in the Tampa area, like north of Tampa, actually. So, um, but yeah, she's got a, a business that that's what she does. So, so off the record, not, not fiduciary, where, crazy stock market, where, where should people be investing their money today? Oh man, that's a great, great. I was waiting for that. You know, when, when are we going to talk to say it? it? Had to. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you how I, I approach it since I'm, I, I don't want anybody to hear this is, is an investment advice. That's what I'm I was saying. This m- is not investment advice. So yep. this- I'm very much a uh, p- passive investor index long-term guide. If folks have not read before the book, The the Index Revolution by, I think it's Charles Ellis, I would highly recommend it. Um, but the, the literature continues to support that active investing approaches in and out predicting the markets especially when you layer on top of that the fees and the tax inefficiencies of that it's not winning uh long term and 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 a more passive low fee stay in the market kind of keep your head down be informed but keep your head down and be able to weather that storm long term is where you need to be so i'm as aggressive now as i ever have been uh honestly i i wish i had a little bit more cash sitting around i'd be putting more money into the market i i think I share the belief of many that we're probably not yet have seen the worst of it. Uh, I still believe that long term, if you look at what's happened with the markets, at least since I've been investing since 2008, uh, and if you look at the historical return since the Great Depression, the market has done its thing. Now, may, maybe not in any given year, but if you look at over 10, 20, 30 year periods, the returns on the graph is only going in one direction. Now, I think you have to pair that with what's your risk tolerance, what's your stomach, and what's your capacity, what risk do you need to take? Two very different things that people often get confused. And then when might I need these funds and what's the strategy as, as I'm looking at doing that? So, you know, I'm 38 years old. Um, I have no plans of retiring as long as I can work because I love what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, want to have that. funds if something would happen that I can't predict that we can, you know, fund things. But you know, I'm, I'm looking at a time period like this. And I, honestly, even the dip we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, I see big dip, I see opportunity. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in, in the traditional markets right now. Um, I'm, I'm really bullish on kind of building some more of the portfolio and wealth also around real estate and, and business and having kind of that three-legged stool of an investment approach. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of of you know the these time periods as Warren Buffett would agree present a lot of opportunity, but it also can cause a lot of anxiety. Uh, yeah, I was well. surprised to hear how few things that Warren Buffett was invested in. I think it would said it yeah. was like four or five things, um, mm-hmm. just yep. in total. Yeah, and he was no. I he said I think a couple of years ago, it might be longer than now. He said you know his his advice. Uh, obviously, he's a very you know, has been over his career, a very active investor, some, someone who has kind of bucked the trend in predicting the markets and so forth. But, you know, he said if, if he was passing on his wealth, as he will at some point, like the vast majority of it should be in boring index funds over a long, long period of time. So, so the podcast is called, yeah. What is your podcast called? Where can we find it? Your Financial Pharmacist Podcast. Uh, it's on our website, yourfinancialpharmacist.com, Apple Podcast, Spotify. We publish three shows a week. We, we do a quick segment on Mondays where we answer a question from our community with one of our CFPs. Uh, I do a more long form show every Thursday okay. uh, on various financial topics, interviewing guests. Is that live stories. or recorded? It's recorded. Okay. Um, and that's and when then, it, sh- it goes online. It goes on yep. th- right, Mondays and Thursdays. Okay. And Saturday, we have a separate real estate show that we started about a year and a half ago, uh, co-hosted by two 
pharmacists, real estate investors that it's, it's an amazing thing of like, they, they now I think are 75 or 80 episode, episodes in of sharing pharmacist stories and connecting pharmacists that are investing in real estate in all different types of way. I mean, tr- traditional buy and hold, fi- okay. fix and flip pharmacist that bought a motel. I mean, just some really, really cool stuff, short-term rentals. And so that's been a really fun community to build. And we see a lot of pharmacists getting more interested in that, although that's dampened a little bit, you know, with the market being what it is right now. Uh, I, I think for, for a variety of reasons, that's catching the interest of pharmacists. So interesting. And, well, and maybe if, there'll be some good buying opportunities finally. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually. Real, real estate. So if somebody is interested in in acquiring your services and reaching out to you, what is the best method? Yeah, I would love to connect on LinkedIn. You can find me, Tim, Tim Albrecht. I'm regularly there posting about personal finance, j- journey as a dad, entrepreneurship. Would love to connect there. And then uh, you can find all the information on our website at yourfinancialpharmacist.com. Do you speak awesome. at any of the shows? I, I've sp- spoken at a number of national and state association meetings, um, so um, and and a handful of other events. O- always interested in in doing more of that. It's it's one of the things I'm really passionate about. So okay, good. All right. Well, we've enjoyed our journey today. Thanks for having me. Uh, look forward to um, talking to you and, and seeing you again. Hopefully, we'll see you at some of the shows, and uh, we'll have to yes, check out I've, the podcast. I'm adding your podcast to my yep. morning drive. Add it to our list. Awesome. Thanks so much. This has been fun. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much, Tim. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcast. Give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more pharmacy professionals like you.